Let's to see Spitzer. So this is how Spitzer look like. It's a telescope. It's just, just a hollow body that actually pierces into this in, into, into space and takes imagery, then takes that imagery and it sends it back to Earth, you know, uh, so that we can actually view it. And we'll see some spectacular views uh, of how that, um, um, of how those um, 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 earthly body, uh, heavenly bodies look like, right? And um, because of that, um, the next question that someone would ask themselves is how do those, how do these um, uh, uh, telescope get to, you know, get to the, to get to orbit in space, you know, and what keeps them going for all of that uh, time. So if you see that, uh, this is Chandra. So you can get, you can send an astronaut uh, to come here and service it. If it's not working well, you can actually send an astronaut and like what we were demonstrating last week when Bob and Doug went to the International Space Station, they can also be sent to Chandra to go and actually look at what, um, what, um, what the fault is, you know, if it's no longer sending us the images, you know. And these bodies have actually been there for a very long time, you know. And uh, we see here uh, one of the pictures that we got from, um, that we got from Spitzer, right? Um, Spitzer gave us this uh, imagery of how other uh, uh, bodies of the universe uh, look like, you know. So we see other stars, we see other clusters, and we see how the universe actually gets to, to look like, right? But we're going to go back again and look at the first one, which is uh, Hubble, right? Um, this is actual, this is Hubble uh, Space Telescope. As you can see, there is the telescope. Um, um, and all the electronics and the mechanics that are involved. And though, uh, there's, there, there's astronauts there uh, that are working on it, you know. And, and, and HAP was launched in 1990 by NASA, right? And, um, and the consortium of other space agencies, right? So here we get to see uh, the two astronauts, uh, Muscrev and Hoffman, um, trying to install some, uh, some, some, some uh, lenses that were not working well. And interesting enough, uh, when Hub was launched in 1990, right? It was launched in 1990, and when it got there, um, they they were failing to get images from it. Why? Because one of their mirrors was not properly aligned, you know. So there was a fault. What do they do? Then they launched what was called Service Mission One, hey, right? Um, hey, so in you. Service Mission One, Musgrave and Hoffman went up, and that was in 1993. Now, uh, three years later, they went up and they, 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 they had to fix the problem that was actually there, you know? So um, uh, before we can, I can actually continue, um, I would show you um, a, a video of um, how Chandra, I mean, how the Harpool um, looks like in, in, in the night sky. Uh, just give me a second. Um, I'm going to stop sharing this one and I'll share another uh, image. Okay, new share. Um, what are you guys seeing now? Are you seeing the, the picture of Hubble Space Tele Telescope? No. Okay, let me let me cancel this one and let me do a new share, right? What I'm going to show you now, I'm going to show you um, Hubble Space uh, Telescope um, in its uh, in its 30th anniversary of how it the images that were sent how they uh, how they look like. And muted. Done. Uh, are you guys seeing, uh, what are you seeing on your screens now? Hubble 30th anniversary imager, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, tell me if you can hear the volume. Played. Yes, it's playing. No. Can you hear the volume? No. 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 no.
Can you hear the, the yes. 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 No. I can't wait. The Hubble Space Telescope has given us an incredible image for its 30th birthday. Yes. No. For new stars. Yes. Nearby satellite no. galaxy. The bright new Stars Shepard, can you hear? Yeah. This image are times more massive than a yes, Powerful radiation from these stars is causing the surrounding gas to glow in stunning colors. The blue indicates oxygen gas heated to Fahrenheit. The red indicates the presence of nitrogen and hydrogen. Those massive stars are also driving powerful winds of charged particles which are sculpting out the bubble and rich structures we can see across the nebula. The blue nebula at the lower left of the image is actually material ejected from a single huge star in the center. That star is 200,000 times brighter than our sun. With stars continuing to form and affect their surroundings, and it's Hubble's exquisite vision from its orbit above Earth's atmosphere that gives us the ability to get a clear glimpse of this kind of incredible beauty and activity. The Hubble Space Telescope has changed the way we think of space and our place in the universe. Hubble has refined our understanding of the age of the universe and its rate of expansion. And through its deep fields, it has peered across billions of adolescent galaxies we can compare with our own Milky Way. It has shown us the telltale effects of mysterious dark energy and dark matter. And it has given us a front row seat to these beautiful interstellar clouds and nebulas with <laughs> surrounding disks of dust and planets continue to form. Hubble is in excellent technical health and is expected to continue its exploration of the universe for quite a few years to come. Multiple astronaut missions to service the Hubble Space Telescope over the years have kept Hubble at the forefront of capability. With each servicing mission, astronauts repaired or replaced instrumentation, keeping Hubble better than ever before. The final servicing mission in 2009 was extremely successful so that even today, Hubble is more scientifically powerful and productive than ever before. You can find out more about the Hubble Space Telescope at the website nasa.gov slash Hubble and on social media at NASA Hubble. Okay, um, I, I think we had a, a good appreciation of how um, Hubble is, um, is is exploiting the the outer um, the outer space, you know, showing us imagery that we wouldn't have otherwise seen by our naked eye, and um, um, because of that, we've had a better appreciation of how the the universe looks like, and that we are not the only people. They are not the only uh, heavenly bodies that, that are there, you know, we get to see that there's more out there in the night sky than um, uh, in the sky than uh, we initially thought, you know, so um, Before Hubble is uh, is about to be uh, Discontinued, you know, it, it has served its mission for 30 years. It's been up there. So next year um, Next year in 2021 NASA will be launching another space, um, I mean, another uh, telescope, you know, I'll tell you about it. Uh, it's called the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. That is, uh, that is going to, that has got more advanced technologies and techniques that will help us understand uh, the universe even in, 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 in a better form, you know. And what is it that we've benefited from our space exploration, you know. And, um, you know, in scientific, um, 
in scientific circles, there's always been a, an argument around the edge of the universe, you know, and scientists feel that because of that, they've had to understand how old the universe is, you know, and, um, and that uh, because of where we are now, we might think this is it only, but actually the universe is expanding, you know, there's more to it out there than we initially thought, you know, and we get to understand something called black holes, you know, which is, I would say, um, beyond the scope of today's uh, class, you know, and hopefully in other sessions, we can actually start to look at what black holes are, how they look like, and what's the fascination around them, understand the science that controls them, you know, um, and that um, extending uh, visible uh, wavelength images, uh, we're starting to, to see that a lot, the solar system coverage, the solar system is not everything that we have. There is actually more, and because of how of what it has done for us, we can get to understand that. And uh, the sixth aspect that we're going to appreciate about uh, space exploration are uh, what are uh, supernovas, you know, the giant uh, planets that are, uh, are exploding, that are creating uh, uh, other planets, you know. They say that every second, a new uh, star is born, you know, like every second, thousands and thousands of stars are born, you know, and how then do we end up containing a universe that is continually uh, giving out more stars, you know, that's why the concept of the ex universe expanding, we can't even put it into terms as to how big the universe is, you know, but God says he can put it in the palm of his hand. You know, that's how big and how great God is in this whole, in this whole um, um, uh, uh, cosmos, you know. And uh, we get to understand uh, the Milky Way, you know, the mass and the size of the Milky Way. What is the Milky Way, you know? So stars and, and, um, stars and planets and, and all the heavenly bodies uh, exist in what they are are called galaxies, you know. What is a galaxy? A galaxy is a constellation of stars, you know, a group of stars. So the galaxy where we are now is called the Milky Way, you know. I'll you show you how the Milky Way looks like uh, later, know. you know. So because Habu is being, um, is, is being uh, discontinued, we are moving over to uh, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, you know, and this is how it looks like, you know. It looks more okay. different it looks very different uh, to, to the Hubble, you know, and it carries uh, out a more exciting equipment in there, you know, deep space exploration. But before we can even go there, uh, I want us to look at two videos, one for Chandra and two for Spitzer, you know, and understand what is Spitzer doing out there in the, in the thing, in the, in the universe, though what, uh, they've been discontinued and all, you know. So I'm going to stop this one. First. And share with you another screen. It's for you. Um, okay. Um, for the next three minutes, three, four minutes, I'm going to show you a video of Spitzer, right? Um, how the 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 Spitzer, Spitzer mission uh, fits into the whole uh, space um, exploration tool, you know? So there it is being launched. result, 
everything that was familiar in the sky, every nebula that we're used to seeing, and visible light images from the ground, things from the Hubble, they became completely different when seen through the infrared eyes of Spitzer. It was this combination of a, a scientific insight that itself was just stunningly beautiful at the same time. The biggest surprise in terms of what was revealed with Spitzer is its ability to characterize exoplanets, and planets around other stars. Awesome. Most notably, we identified a system called TRAPPIST-1, which has seven Earth-sized planets sort of snuggling up to what's a very cool star. And of those planets, three of them at least are in the habitable zone. When Spitzer launched, exoplanet science was absolutely not part of the science portfolio we were offering for Spitzer because it wasn't considered to be sensitive enough to do that kind of observations. But while in flight, mm -hmm. astronomers became clever about how they could use it. Engineers became very clever about how we could repurpose Spitzer. And exoplanet science has actually become one of the core science projects of Spitzer since then. The Google Doodle the was Trappist-1 is what kind of finished me off on a glorious day. Um, when your adult children point out that, you know, my mom works on that telescope. You know, that's, that's very rewarding. Spitzer Space Telescope is a technological marvel. I never had any conception that we'd be going for 16 years. The little machine that could go beyond its primary design. The longevity of the mission is a direct result of the engineers and scientists and people that have supported the mission. In a place that dares mighty things, you can do it together. And so when you have that kind of union, I think what happens is magic. I'm hoping Spitzer will be remembered as in a really amazing uh, scientific gift and that it allowed us to kind of transform our understanding of some very yeah. important aspects of astronomy. And yeah. I think Spitzer's been integral to all that. We have a huge archive that is waiting to be mined. And its, it's revelations already have been tremendous and revolutionary. That only time will tell what is Spitzer's greatest legacy. Okay, um, I, I'm sure we've got an appreciation of what uh, Spitzer is actually doing out there for, for, for us in the night sky and the opportunities uh, of Spitzer uh, in terms of understanding um, the, the night sky. Um, one, one important aspect that we actually we learned in the process there was um, the, the opportunities that still lay uh, beyond um, the data that was mined and gathered due to uh, the exploration that Spitzer did, you know. And scientists are still marveling at what uh, Spitzer could uh, show them out there in the night sky. And I think it will be an amazing uh, gift to, to us in Africa that to, to have one, one of you um, uh, uh, get to, to travel out um, uh, to save us one of those um, space um, uh, bodies like Hubble, Spitzer, the International Space Center, and we can get to, to have a sneak peek of how the universe actually looks like. And you'll start understanding how great and majestic and, 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 and great God is. I'm going to give you uh, the last uh, uh, image here, um, the last video uh, for, for today. Uh, then we move on to something else. Uh, this is um, a space launch that was there to save this one of the uh, missions that was there. And control of all the vehicle's critical functions. T minus 20 seconds and counting. Mm -hmm. 15 seconds. This was in the space program. I mean, the space shuttle program. And there it is taking off 10, now. 9, 8, 7. We have a go for main engine start. <laughs> Booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. Wow. Houston now controlling the flight of Columbia, the international research mission finally underway. Wow. Roger, roll, Columbia. 
welcome to Columbia, now rolling on to the proper azimuth for a 39-degree inclination to orbit. Shuttle on a heads-down, wings-level position for the eight-and-a-half-minute ride to orbit. Wow. 30 seconds into the flight, the three liquid fuel main engines beginning to throttle back in a three-step fashion to 72% of rated performance, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. Columbia already two and a half miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, four and a half miles in altitude. The main engines beginning to rev up to full throttle, 104% of rated performance. Columbia, you send your go at throttle up. We copy go at throttle up. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Rick Husband, joined on the flight deck by pilot Willie McCool, flight engineer Colt Nachavla, and mission specialist Dave Brown. Mission Specialist Laurel Clark, Payload Commander Mike Anderson, and Payload Specialist Elon Ramon seated down on the mid-deck. One minute, 26 seconds into the flight. Columbia, 10 miles downrange, 13 miles in altitude, traveling at 1,800 miles an hour. It's away from solid rocket booster separation. Everything looking good on board, Columbia. Solid rocket booster separation confirmed. Guidance now converging. Columbia's onboard computers commanding the main engine nozzles to gently swivel, aiming the shuttle for a precise target in space for main engine cutoff. Columbia now 43 miles down range. Yeah, so uh, we get to we got to see the launch of one of the space um, um, we, one of the space. Um, so Columbia was going there on 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 a service mission, going to service one of the one of the um, uh, the, spa the 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 telescopes that that are out there in the in the in the atmosphere. You know, I mean in the in in space. You know, and because of that, we get to understand now that um, when there is a problem out in space, we take that rocket, get your astronauts in there, get all your equipment, then you shoot out into space and you saw how that happened, you know? So all of those bodies that are there, because just like um, uh, our fathers and your ma our mother's cars, you know, need to get serviced, you know? Um, the space stations out there, they also, and the telescopes, they need to also get what, get serviced. And that servicing happens uh, because of um, those kind of, uh, those kind of missions. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, put my last um, of uh, my last set of screens here, uh, then I open it up for discussion. So because um, a hub was being decommissioned, we are, we will be getting the James Webb telescope that was launching next year. So watch out for, for that uh, amazing launch. I'm sure it's going to be spectacular. And this is how it's actually it's going to look like in, 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 in space, you know, totally different to what the other ones are looking, uh, are looking like, you know, more technology, more exciting stuff that we're going to see, you know, and we see uh, uh, some of the uh, engineers working on uh, some of the uh, uh, the telescopes that go out uh, in there, you know. And what is it? What type of images do we get from um, uh, from these telescopes? You know, one of the most famous pictures that we've gotten from Hubble, you know, uh, is is this picture that you are seeing here on the screen? It's called the Pillars of Creation, you know, and it was given that name because of its majestic structure, you know, and it is in um, uh, it is in such a form that it acts as if it is holding the universe together, you know, and just it, it, it's as if they are pillars, you know, but they're just wonderful, beautiful, heavenly bodies, you know, and we wouldn't have known that there is things like that out there without us sending out um, uh, those kind of uh, instruments into the into the night sky, you know. So we uh, uh, we see here also in Nebula 24, Peace Music, uh, which is another cluster and a constellation of stars. 
um, that we that we that we, we get to see. And exciting enough, you know, Habu gave us this beautiful image of um, uh, the Sachun rings, right? Um, it it combined because of its architecture. The, uh, telescopes, it combined the images from Saturn and it gave us a spectacular view of Saturn, you know, and we couldn't have otherwise managed to get had we looked it with our naked eyes, you know, um, and, and, and also here uh, on, on Hapu, we see uh, uh, Shoemaker Levy, right, how it looks like, you know, and there are a lot of them, we can never finish them, you know, these are just excerpts from uh, what Hapu was doing out to us you know one of the most beautiful ones is uh, uh, the mystic uh, cluster of Karina uh, which is in the nebula uh, WF um, WFC uh, 3 you know which is uh, the naming convention of, 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 of stars in that cluster and um, if you look at it just imagine you are seeing a, a star that beautiful in the night sky you know and that's where you start realizing that this is actually a beautiful amazing um, you know, a uh, universe that you are living in, you know, and uh, as we spoke about last week, for us to be able to do all of these things, we send astronauts out there and they could perform what they are called the extra vehicular uh, activities. And out of that, we get to see all of these images uh, that were actually that we get to, to see, you know, and um, um, uh, I won't go into detail into all of this, but um, this is actually purported to be the gateway to heaven, you know, uh, the Orion Nebula. And I don't want to go into the intricacies of that, but this is one of the most beautiful, spectacular openings out there in the in the night sky. You know, it's as if it's swallowing something and it's opening out a beautiful image of how uh, the night sky uh, looks like, you know. And uh, we've spoken about Carina Nebula. And um, uh, remember when we were talking about Spitzer, we did say that um, the video did illustrate that there is more and more stars that are actually being uh, are created. And here we see infant stars coming into life, you know. Um, it's like our stars are being born and, 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 and okay. when a star is born, the universe is continually expanding and everything. And we still don't understand um, uh, how uh, big this universe uh, is, you know. And uh, we see the Krebs Nebula, which is one of the most spectacular views, again, in the night sky. Um, and um, the grand design galaxy, you know. Um, so when you look at our Milky Way, we look exactly like this, you know. And and Earth is just a tiny part of this uh, this whole uh, structure altogether, you know. And again, this is another mystic um, mystic uh, view of the uh, of 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 the pillars of creation, you know. And um, uh, the section of the Orion Nebula, and all of these images came from Habu, you know. And these are just but a few images that we get to see from the Earth um, from the from these telescopes, you know? And, and um, yeah, I think uh, for today, um, I will end it here and I'll open it up for questions. <laughs> I think the most important thing we have to realize, boys and girls, is how great God is in terms of creation. Like, if you look at all these uh, stars, the universe that is created, it just shows us that our God is a big God, you know? And uh, imagine when uh, most of us have asked the question, so if you're in America and Jesus is coming, will you be able to see him in Africa and in America at the same time? But if you're, looking at, the earth, if you're looking at the earth from space and God says he can actually hold the whole universe, not only the earth, the whole universe in the, in the palm of his hands. So it shows that we worship a God who is big. And our God is so big that he makes anything that we dream of and want to achieve in life uh, possible. Some of you want to be doctors, some of you want to be mechanics, engineers, some of you want to go to space. And believe you me, one of you will go to space here because they so passionately want to go to space. And if we work hard at school, we do our studies properly, we continue being good children to our parents, good children to God, good children to the community. God will make everything possible for us, right? So 
we are going to open it up for uh, questions and then Uncle Marvin will, will respond to the questions that we have. And remember again next week, I think I will make this announcement now before some of you leave. Next week, we're going to talk about the human brain. Uh, I don't know what Dr. Rachel is going to say, but I'm excited about it. I want to know how the brain functions, what the brain looks like, what the brain can do, and all these kinds of things. Uh, do we have yeah, same ID or same password? Yes, yes. Yeah, same ID or same password? Ruru, you have a question, right? Tine? Um, you can unmute yourself. Um, I'm struggling to unmute you from my end. My question is, how do the astronauts know where the, where the, where the telescope is? Oh, okay. Um, can I answer or? Okay, so, to... go to Hazel. Hazel also. Um, I wanted to ask, will there be a person in the telescope or does it, is it self-control? Okay. Okay. All right, you can take those two questions. Now, um, um, the, the, the other thing that I hope we would be able to cover is the entire operations of how uh, the whole value chain looks like. So um, the astronaut is just but a tiny part of everything else that we are viewing, right? So uh, there, is, um, there are engineers on the ground uh, mostly at um, mission control, you know, in Houston, that are controlling this, um, these stations remotely. They're able to track where the, 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 the telescope is. And then when they launch the, the, the rocket that is carrying the, the astronaut, you know, it's done in such a way that it can track it up until it, 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 uh, it meets up with, um, with, uh, with the, with the telescope, you know, so it's it's not just the job of the astronauts, but it's the job of those that are on the ground that are helping it to track where it is. So as is now, we're able to track where the whole thing is um, is sitting at, and I think it answers both questions. All right, all right. Who else has a question? I do. Um. Okay. What's your question? My question is, I saw that it was Orion Nebula, but I, um, before I saw Orion Nebula, I thought I saw um, Young Nebula. Are they both the same or separate? Um, no, it was Orion Nebula. Um, I think um, the other part that I showed you was um, uh, the, 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 the misty clouds uh, of, of the creation of, of the pillars of the universe. You know, so there's like a category of them, you know, different types of 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 uh, of, um, of stars, and the other one that I showed you was uh, the tiny stars, the smaller stars coming into life. How stars are created. Oh, uh, I have okay. a question. Yes. I have a question. Um, so uh, when another spaceship uh, leaves. How do you know that it's left? Um, uh, the last video that I showed you um, showed you how the, um, a spaceship is launched from, from ground, you know? Um, and the guys at Mission Control keep track of what is happening in, the night, in, the, in, the, in, in space, you know? And um, they, they know the geolocation, the position of each and every body that is out there, you know, especially the ones that they launched. Just like aeroplanes, have, you've never heard, have you ever heard that there's aeroplanes that collided in, 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 in what, in the, in the sky, you know? Yes. No, you haven't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell us more. <laughs> Muta? Aeroplanes, when they land, they land with wheels. Once they, once they, once they start flying, they, they start with wheels. 
And once they are in the air, they start going higher and higher and until they can't go anywhere else. And then they start going to countries that the people that have come abroad want to go. Wow. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mutsa. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, what we're trying to say is that um, because the, the flight commanders, the flight directors on the ground um, are keeping track of uh, where each and every spacecraft is, um, that helps in them not colliding. So airplanes won't hit each other in the air. You know, there's never been a fatality of that nature, you know. So the same thing that uh, mission control does, uh, the guys that are launching the rockets, they have got a dashboard and a, and a view of everything else that they are seeing um, out in, the, in, 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 in space uh, so that whatever instruction they give remotely, you know, uh, we've used remote controls, right? So a remote control is still the same technique that is used. Uh, I mean, the same principle of remote controlling uh, spacecraft uh, so that we'll be able to, um, yeah, uh, this is actually a, uh, thank you so much, uh, Shepard, on that one. So if you see here, you know, um, this is um, uh, Flight Rider 24. It's showing us all of the aeroplanes that are there, you know. And when you get a view of all how all of these aeroplanes are like, you know, they have got an, a bad eyes view of all of that. And because of that, they won't hit each other. Even though they look like they are uh, they're on top of each other, they won't hit each other. I, I hope that answers the question. I have a question. Uh, uh, yes. What kind of thing does a um, spaceship use? Is it just like a car fuel or is it different? Now, we, we spoke about it last week. Uh, we said it's called rocket fuel, right? Now, rocket fuel is a combination of a lot of uh, gases. Some of them, they are liquid, liquid oxygen. Uh, there is um, they, they, they different propellants that are used, you know? So yeah, they, they have got a special fuel that they use and it's called um, uh, rocket, rocket, rocket fuel. What weapons do you use? I have a, I have a question. Yes. How, hey, do how are you? Does get born? <laughs> it, it, it's still a, a very complicated uh, science, Lyle. Um, around how our stars get born. But um, that actually goes on to explain. And then goes around. Okay, this goes to explain uh, the, the, um, the beauty of our studying the universe, whereby um, just from um, what you spoke about called supernovas, when stars explode, you know, new ones are born, you know. And uh, a smaller star can export and bigger stars get born. So because of that, of the chemical reaction that are happening inside, uh, the supernovas, What's my second and they give us uh, new uh, stars. So there's a, a lot of um, um, uh, reactions that happen in there uh, that help it to, 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 to give rise to new stars, you know? Okay. Uh, did it answer your question, Lyle? Yes. Wonderful. Um, I'll just get dead and mom and dead to, to give you more videos of, 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 of um, you know, of how stars are born and, and everything else. And you can have a visual of how they look like. Um, so next week, uh, when we come, should we use the same password and ID or... No. Um, well, uh, Anki Shepard is going to um, uh, facilitate that. He's going to send out new communication on that, uh, on that note. All right. Are we, are we, are we all happy? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Tine Ruru, um, you have your hands up. You can unmute yourself. Ruru? Yeah. 
I have one last question. If I remember, I'll ask. Okay, go ahead. I can't remember my question. Oh, okay. Okay, when you remember, just let us know. <clears throat> Was that a question from Anki Shepard about uh, rocket fuel? Yeah, if, if you, what happens if you use petrol or diesel into, into the spaceship? Will Look, uh, you can experiment with, uh, uh, take a hose pipe and fill it in your car. A hose pipe of what? Of water? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fill it in your car. <laughs> the experience that you're going to get is exactly <laughs> what um, in the spaceship. When can I try to answer that? Yeah, yes. Answer, yeah. Can I try to answer that? Yes. Okay, so um, it's just like a car. When uh, you put water inside a car, uh, pretending like it's petrol, it will uh, like completely damage your car. You don't have a car anymore. So the uh, same applies as a rocket. If you put petrol or fuel for a car mm -hmm. on a rocket, yeah. you don't have a rocket anymore. Like it's completely dead. But no. these are both fuels, ne? Gerald, these are both fuels. Yeah, but um, okay, maybe um, we could go into the chemical reactions of those things, right? So um, you re you realize that uh, these spacecraft, uh, because of the energy levels that are, are are needed and the reactions that need to go in there, you know, so you need pure oxygen in a certain state, you know, and specifically oxygen in liquid form for it to support a highly combustive uh, reaction like that, so that it can power off the engine. For the solid, uh, for the for the rocket boosters to take it out, you know, because those are like very big, big, big engines, you know. So uh, anything that doesn't uh, um, burn at a faster rate than what is actually used there won't give it lift off. It won't take off. It just won't take off. All right, Walter. Walter, Walter, your end is up. I wanted to ask a question, like you showed us, I think Okay, I think we lost you there. The second or first or second. Uh, please come again. Repeat your question. Water. Repeat your question, Walter. My question was, you showed us the video where, um, I think it was a second, no, I think first or second, where, where, you, where you showed us where um, the planets, there were some lines, uh, um, circles, and then the planets on, the, on, the, on that, on that um, thing, on the ground, and then why, why were the planets on the ground there? They're actually not on the ground. <laughs> so we are also part of the of of of, of the universe, you know. So uh, relative to where we are, we look like we are on the ground, but we are not even on the ground. We are rotating as is now. We are rotating at a very fast space uh, pace that you can't even uh, imagine. You are moving at, you know. So um, we are actually moving now, but you are not feeling it. <coughs> Of, um, uh, the magnitude of uh, the earth and who you are in the in, in, in the whole equation, you know. So that's the the, the marvelous part about about um, you know how these heavenly bodies operate. They don't collide, you know. They are all in their own orbit, and they are perfectly balanced in the very same way they are, you know, hanging out there in space. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome, Walter. All right. Uh, yes, you remembered your question now, Tine. All right, you can ask. How do rockets land? Um, now, it's a very interesting uh, question because uh, it talks about the history of space uh, travel, right? Um, because of the different missions, let me give you just a, a, a brief overview of, of the missions. 
So in the Apollo, in the Apollo, the Gemini and um, um, the Apollo Gemini and Gemini missions. So when they when 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 they return from their mission, they land on water. You know, if you've got a, an opportunity, ask your dad to uh, make you watch the movie Apollo 13. So you get to see how um, uh, in the Apollo area, in the Apollo era, how they used to land. Then from there, it moved to the space shuttle. So in the space and in the in the Apollo era, they used to land in a capsule, you know, um, in a capsule, and they will land on water, you know. Uh, then uh, the rescue guys will come and rescue them. Then from there, it moved to the space shuttle era. The space shuttle era, it was the space shuttles that looked like aeroplanes. So they would just take off and come back as an aeroplane, right? Then now we are in uh, reusable. Um, so the first era, the, the Apollo era, the spaceships were not usable, you know? So everything gets lost. Whatever went up just doesn't come back again, you know? Then with the... Um, with, uh, with the space shuttle era, they would come back, but it was a very expensive exercise, you know? Then uh, thirdly, with the reusable spaceship now that we have, if you watch the space launch uh, last week uh, or the other week uh, with Elon Musk and them, you know, so they come back after they've taken it into orbit, they return back and land on Earth, you know? I'll send you a video. I'll send. I'll. I'll. I'll, I'll send you. Uh, who is your dad? I think I have it. Yeah. Oh, oh there it is. I'm Nikwa. Oh, okay. Okay. No, that's fine. I'll. I'll. Yeah. I'll. I'll, I'll send one to your dad. Thank you. Okay, well, all that. So you can actually see here um, the Falcon Heavy rocket land uh, when uh, you know the solid rocket boosters uh, land after they've taken the, the spaceship into 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 orbit. Um, I'm sure you can see that picture. Okay, who else has got a question? Walter, you can ask your question. So if, if, if a rocket, how can the rocket, like, how does the, does it, Pressure to come. Walter, we didn't get your question. I think your network is a, a glitch. Yeah. I think there's Yola and Nizol also on the line. Any questions from Cape Town? Walter, you can ask your question again. Let's see. Maybe your connection will work. I wanted to ask when a rocket lands, does it use pressure to come down? No, it doesn't use pressure to come down. No, it doesn't use pressure to come down at all. So it is guided back uh, to its geolocation where it, um, where it needs to land. Mm -hmm. So there's no pressure involved in, in it landing. You might think we can't attribute pressure to be to be what uh, um, makes it land. So then, what does it use? Um, well, it 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 navigates because remember it's a flying object, right? It's a flying object. So because of flying object, so it will flip itself back again to 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 to, to the earth. Just think about it. Just think about. Um, remember, it's still in the influence of the Earth's gravitational force, as opposed to in space. You know, so it doesn't get to space. Just before it gets to space, it uh, it it detaches from the main uh, so uh, from the from the main rocket, um, from the main capsule that is actually going. Then they return back. You know, using the Earth's gravitational uh, force.
Okay, who has a question? Who else has a question? Yaruru. My question is when they were when they used um space shuttles, right? Did they ever when they were landing and coming down, did they drive trucks and try and what to call it and place where they were going to land and then the truck then the space shuttle would land on the truck? No, 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 no. So the space shuttle era, um, so you will think about um take for example service mission one, right? I think it was discovered. And 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 by the way, some of them uh, blew up as they were as they were taking off. So you know they discovered discovered it blew up in 1986 when they were taking off and all the astronauts died, you know. And that was Apollo Apollo 10. Um no no Apollo 1, Gus Chris Omi, Ed Weiss and Roger Chaffe, I think they all died on Apollo 1, you know, uh, because on takeoff they um they there was uh, some stuff that happened and uh, the hatch wouldn't open and they blew up. You know, so uh, when they are landing, remember in the space shuttle era, think about Discovery, you, you, you think about Columbia, they were all like uh, aeroplanes. So let me just show you a video, a quick video um, of um, space shuttle Columbia disaster. Uh, just give me a second. Okay, um, I'm gonna sh share the screen. You see how it looks like? Yes. Yeah, so it's coming back now, it's coming back. Um, so we, we get to see that they, when they are coming to land, when they are coming to land, it's like an aeroplane coming to land and things don't go well, especially when it's entering, because when it's coming from space, coming to enter into the earth atmosphere, right? There's a lot of ionizing radiation in that layer. And if things are wrong and if something is damaged, the whole spaceship can actually explode. And that has actually happened with what uh, with space shuttle uh, Columbia. And seven astronauts that were in there died. You know, just imagine you're waiting for your for your parents or whatever, and they all die in that space uh, ship, all because of one technical error. And some sensors wouldn't read and everything, and things happened. You know. So yeah, and next Ow. question. Any other questions? So guys, are we are we happy for today? Yes. Yes. No. Thank you. Yes. No. No. Just a second. Just a second. Last question from Hazel. Hazel, Hazel. You have a question? Okay, what causes errors in an airplane or a rocket? <laughs> There's a lot of things that could go wrong. There's like a thousand moving parts in there and uh, anything can just go wrong. You know, it could be um, I know. Well, it could be a damaged body of the, uh, of the aircraft, uh, pressure getting in, and it could be a general fault in there. You know, because of that, they don't have time to stop and fix it. It will blow up and things would, you know, just like an accident, you know, um it in here we usually have accidents because of bad driving but in there there's no bad driving it could be a, a fair technical error in the in the, in the space Masam, right. any questions no are we happy no no hmm? Who is saying they are not happy? It's me. Who is it's that? Bella. Hey, what's up? It's Bella. Um, why don't 
Today, just uh, do uh, the brain topic now. The doctor is in Cape Town and she's not uh, connected. So um, she will be with us next week on, uh, on Saturday. So she, she has to prepare a presentation for you guys. She works at a university. We Isn't can you know what a uh, Do we know what a university is? Yes. Yes, what is it? <laughs> it's a place for people who are done with high school. <laughs> so it's a place for people who are done with high school. They Then they do research. They Even these spaceships that we're looking at, these guys who have been to university and they're making those things. So Dr. Rachel did a uh, PhD at Vice. Uh, in Johannesburg. She's now working at the University of Cape Town. She did stuff on neuroscience and, and physiology of the brain or something like that. So she will come up next week with a presentation just for you guys. Because at university we teach old people mostly. So when we're making our lessons, we make it for old people so that they understand easily. So when we make a lesson for you guys, we have to make it also for your age so that you can easily understand it. So that's what she's doing currently. Uh, next week, she'll be able to come with a lesson just for you, teach you about the brain, and then she will let you ask questions. And then we'll see. Imani, your hand is up. Imani. And unmute yourself. I'm still looking for the pictures of the angels. No pastor is the pictures of the angels. They told me, no, we can't get those pictures. They're not available. Okay, Imani. But they are pictures on Google. Yes, it's easy. Just let Imani ask the question, or we'll come back to Imani. Um, I didn't hear what you said. Is your mic working? Just speak again. Imani. I don't have my And there's Vincent on the line. Ask Mali to come to the computer and speak. Yeah. Let's see if it's working. I think your microphone is not working. Is Mami there? Ask Mami to come and speak. Maybe the proof. Hello. Uh, so I can't hear you. I don't know what the problem is. You are unmuted, but then I can't hear you. Does so she yeah, have um, No, uh, she has left. Oh, she's still there. I still can't hear you. Tell her to type. Huh? Type the question. Um, Are you able to type the question? Oh, oh okay. Uh, please type the question. Okay. So, yeah, the, the, the pictures of the angels that are on Google. <laughs> <laughs> just, just put my picture on the screen. Yes. Not in your money. <laughs> we have seen the pictures of the angels in book. <laughs> and I still have them. Me! I still, I still have them. I still have them. still have them. Yes, just show me. I'll show you. But then... 
I think let's close the session. <laughs> let's close the session. The key takeaways for the day. And discuss about the story of the angels some other time, guys. <laughs> So, look for a pastor to tell us about the angels. Yes, so, please, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, the story of the angels today won't fly. The money, the money has to be typing the question. Or... Okay. I don't see anything from the money now. It seems your, your microphone might not be working because you can hear us and we can't hear her. <laughs> So the angels, guys, will, will present to you. <laughs> what I want us to learn, guys, is how big and powerful God is and how he makes things possible. So we can look at the brain because we know uh, doctors have seen our brain and they know how they work. We can look at the heart. We can even look at how God has given engineers brains to do electronic stuff or to build bridges or to build buildings. Uh, the question is coming. Um, how do astronauts sleep in the in the in the in the space uh, station? Do they float? Do they tie themselves on the on the equipment and stuff? <laughs> Uh, how do they know when to wake up and all these kinds of things? Do they feel dizzy when they're up there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a very interesting question. But they sleep normal as if, um, like, just just like us, you know? And um, the only difference would be that there's no force of gravity, you know? Remember, what makes you sleep is not uh, just the environment, but what is uh, called the circadian clock in your body. You know, uh, that regulates what ah. time they go. And I think so, next week, uh, so next week, uh, Rachel, when she comes to and uh, tell us about the brain, uh, I'm sure she will talk about the circadian clock, what actually makes a human being sleep. You know, the, the, the part of the brain that says it's time to sleep now, you know. So at any given time, yes, they do have beds. There is, um, it, it's, like a, it's like a big house. Uh, um, being in, in the National Space International Space Station, you know. So you get to have those beds. Yes, they can actually sleep normally. Do they have TVs? TVs? Mm, not seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Ozaki, Ozaki wants to respond. Do they have TV in space? Mm, one. Huh? One. One. Mm -hmm. Ozaki says there's one TV in space. I don't know where she, <laughs> she, where she's seen that TV, but uh, look. <laughs> there are no TVs in space. Thank you. If there are no TV, how do they keep themselves entertained? <laughs> they are serious. They don't need entertainment. No, I'm saying. <laughs> how do they keep themselves entertained, <laughs> So they can sleep even if there is no force of gravity. Yes. yes. Remember, sleeping is a psychological thing. It's not just a part. You can sleep sitting down. Yeah, yes, but then it's difficult to sleep with no force of gravity. Your body will be moving everywhere. And what if the people they're coming in? You can't sleep then. No, the the, the pressure and the uh, Zakia, wait, please. Uh, the pressure, Zakia, please wait. I'm checking the money, man. Yes, please. Um, so the pressure in there is such that it's normal. You, you don't, they, they breathe normally. Um, and they, the only thing that's just not, there is just force of gravity. Their lives continue like normal. They're able to perform all of those things that they perform. You know, you could sleep, sit it down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When, when, when you guys are flying to to the UK and stuff. You sleep in the aeroplane sitting down, right? Who has ever taken a flight? <laughs> Did you sleep in the aeroplane? Yeah, you can and sleep. It was my dad and he just did a two hour. Yeah, sometimes a 15 hour flight. I think from Jopek to New York is like 14 and a half hours or something like that. 
So imagine you are in the air for 15 hours, which is more than half a day. So people just sleep up there while sitting. You just recline your chair and then you can easily sleep. But sometimes, that's why we have the, what you call those neck pillows, so that you can just be comfortable. But it's not all that comfortable. So, so, what, if, so what if the, the rocket, um, something go, goes on with the rocket while it's there asleep? What will they do? Can I answer that question? Okay, has it? It will, the uh, rocket will blow up at least they're sleeping, and I'm sure they will all die. Yeah, they, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, they will die. There's nothing else you can do. They will die. Okay. After she said that, I don't think I want to go to space anymore. Oh, is it? No, but, yeah, but in, people are sleeping. You can still be involved in an accident while, you are, while, while someone is driving. We shouldn't be living on Earth anymore also. So, Herald, what's happening is every, every generation of spacecraft engineering, they seek to improve uh, the, 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 the conditions of, the, of, the, of, the, of their equipment uh, to make it easier for, to not have accidents and all these kinds of things. For instance, if you ask your dad, cars long back didn't have airbags. Do you know what an airbag is? Yes, it's the white bubble that comes out if there's an accident. So if the there's an that is long days, people used to hit their heads on the dashboard for the airbags. But now uh, they realize that we can actually um, limit the, the excesses of injuries through airbags. They put airbags. So when there's an accident and airbags comes out, your head is going to the um, dashboard and then it missed the airbag, and then you survive, right? So those are sort of developments that happen along the way as we develop the travel equipment. So maybe you'll be the first one to go to space from South Africa. <laughs> All right, So guys. you mean no one, wait. So you mean no one has went to space from South Africa? Uh, there is. Um, there is. There is. Um, um, Mark Shackleworth. But he went there as a tourist, not yes. as an engineer, or as an astronaut. All right. Are we guys happy? Yes. Can we call it a day? Yes. I'll see you next week. Yes. Okay, bye. Thank you so much, guys. Don't don't get corona. Who wants to pray for us? <laughs> Who wants to pray for us, guys? Okay, let us pray. I'll pray for you. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this session. We thank you for showing us how big you are, for teaching us how big you are. We pray also, Lord, that you may teach these children that anything is possible as long as they follow your ways, they obey their parents, and become good children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm. Thank you so All much, right. guys. Bye. I'll see you next week. You know? Bye. 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 Uh, Shepard, make sure that is uh, properly recorded. There's a lot Thank of people. Bye. 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 The recording will go to the email, I think. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye, -bye everyone. Bye. 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 Where is your dad? What is my name? Is Jura. My dad. My dad. <laughs> Where is he? Ah, Mr. Hey, Mr. Bye. Hey, Jim. How are you? Fine, Doc. How are you? Good. I see you're wearing slippers with socks. You're getting old. Muta, how are you? I'm fine. Where is Daddy? In, in is this in the dining room watching sermons? Yeah. Yeah. No, my guys, thanks for this, eh?
Eh? Oh. That's for this organization, eh? Uh, we're just trying to, to do something for the kids and see how it goes. No, it's quite good, right? Why do you want to decide like Yeah, let's hope the brain session will be exciting also. Yeah, we will not go to that way, but I think it should be fine. <laughs> All okay. right, cool. Yeah. Cool. Bye, bye. Bye, guys. Cheers, cheers. It was nice having you. Did Musa go to call you there? How are you? I'm good. How are you? How is the lockdown? Uh, we, we are locked down indeed. <laughs> No, and how are you? Uh, no, we're doing well under the circumstances. Um, are, are you in Nimpop? No, 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 I'm in Jobe. I'm in Midrand. So you're lecturing by remote control? Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they just got their data this week, I think. They don't have laptops yet, so I don't know what's going to happen. Is it? Yeah, so hey. hopefully... So you're yeah, buying laptops? Ah, the university was asking some organizations to buy. I think they wanted 5,500. So far, they've got 200. 200 laptops? Yeah, because oh, wow. one supplier was actually telling me there are no more laptops in South Africa now, which can be sold in bulk because universities have taken most of them. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Because <laughs> I know, because I'm having a project in Limpopo, and we bought 801 laptops. In sure. uh, uh, that was what, just before the just the before lockdown. the the lockdown. And already yeah. we were being told that uh, uh, if you guys if you guys don't place an order now, you are not going to get. Yeah. yeah so that crisis. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> One supplier was actually telling me, ah, it's going to be tough. 5,500. It is. <laughs> it is. It, it is. Yeah, but you guys have started teaching already. Vets and UCT and others are way ahead. Yeah, no. Yeah. No, we had already started because I think we, the student got their laptop some time ago. Yeah. Some time ago. Yeah. 